How to calculate standard cell potential going to be the topic of this lesson. My name is Chad and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, in addition to high school and college science prep, we also do MCAT, DAT, and OAT prep as well. You can find those courses at chadsprep.com and I'll leave a specific link in the description below. Now, this lesson is part of my new general chemistry playlist. I'm releasing several lessons a week throughout the rest of this school year. So if you want to be notified every time I post one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. So standard cell potential, we talked about this uh, in, in the last lesson. It's also called the EMF, the electron motive force, or the E cell, or the cell potential, or the voltage. All those mean the same thing, and it's measured in volts. So, and it turns out uh, we've got a standard way of calculating this, and what we provide you uh, to give you a tool to do this is what we call a table of standard reduction potentials. So it gives kind of a, a reduction half reaction and assigns a voltage value to it. So, and it turns out that voltage values are all relative and this gets a little bit tricky. And so how do they have this table since everything's relative? Well, they have it because they did one very special thing and they took this lovely reaction right here, that 2H plus plus two electrons going to H2. And we talked about that one in the last lesson as well. That is the standard hydrogen electrode, the SHE and they assigned it arbitrarily a value of zero. And with it being zero, then every other value you see up here is measured relative to assigning this one a value of zero. So that's how that works. So if you take a look like your car battery, your car battery is rated for like 12 volts. Well, it, it doesn't, you know, it, it's kind of a little bit tricky what that actually means. What it really means is that the cathode is 12 volts higher in potential than the anode. It's a potential difference. So how high is the cathode really? Well, I don't know. It's 12 volts higher than the anode. Is that like, you know, 20 and 8 or 188 or like, you know, 5 and negative 7 or oh, we don't know. There's, you know, it's everything's relative. And so we just know that the difference between the cathode and anode on your car battery is 12 volt difference. We have the same issue here. You could compare any two half reactions and combine them and get a voltage value out of that. But you just know their relationship to each other. By assigning one single reaction a value of zero and using that as the basis of our comparison, we call this a reference electrode. Uh, now I can, by having everything compared to it and giving it a value, I can now compare them to each other as well. And so real convenient here. So you should know the reaction for the standard hydrogen electrode and you should know it's assigned a value of zero. All right, so these reduction potentials, uh, you know, we decided to write them as reductions. If you notice, electrons are on the reactant side of every single one of them. So it used to be back in the day that you might just as likely see a, a table of standard oxidation potentials, although that's not quite so common anymore. You're not likely to ever encounter it. So, and the reason is that they're not both needed. If you have the standard reduction potentials, well, the standard oxidation potentials would just be the exact reverse reactions. Instead of Al3 plus plus three electrons going to Al, which has a value of negative 1.66 volts, you'd have Al going to Al3 plus plus three electrons, and it would have a value of positive 1.66 volts. If you reverse the direction, you change the sign. So that's kind of how that works. So by giving you a table of reduction potentials, you can infer all the reverse reactions and the table of corresponding oxidation potentials as well. So you definitely don't need both. And most of the textbooks you're ever going to encounter are simply going to give you just the table of reduction potentials alone. All right, so what we use these then to calculate these standard cell potentials. And so we're gonna start uh, with an example here. So, but we gotta get one thing out of the way and it's the way things are kind of defined here. And so it turns out that when you're calculating E cell, the standard cell potential, the most common way you're gonna see it presented is cathode minus anode. And this is gonna be a little bit tricky. And so if you notice what happens at the cathode, well, reduction happens at the cathode and we have no problems with this. But what happens at the anode? Well, it turns out oxidation happens at the anode. But when they do cathode minus anode, what they're not telling you is that you're using the reduction potential value at the cathode and the reduction potential value at the anode. They're not saying, don't look at the reaction backwards, don't change the sign, just use reduction potentials. And you might be like, but Chad, oxidation happens at the anode. I know, and I find that very aggravating as well. But here's the deal. By using the reduction potential here, by subtracting it as part of the equation, that changes the sign for you and you don't have to change it yourself. So that's kind of the deal. If you do cathode minus anode, that's where that's coming from. We also talked about in the last lesson with the diagrams on galvanic cells, how it was always customary to put the anode on the left and the cathode on the right. 
And by doing it that way, sometimes instead of seeing cathode minus anode, you see right minus left, and it uh, defined that way. And that's why it is very proper to always put the anode on the left and the cathode on the right. That's why that was such a big deal, because sometimes the equation is defined in those left and right terms. So but whether you do cathode minus anode, personally my favorite, is actually just look at it as reduction potential plus oxidation potential, which means if you're adding in an oxidation potential, then you're gonna take a look at one of these reduction potentials and you're gonna be looking at it backwards and changing the sign yourself. So you gotta be really careful though. So if you subtract, then you don't change the signs yourself. You use the exact signs as they appear in your table of reduction potentials. However, if you're going to add in the oxidation potential of the anode, that means you've already changed the sign yourself and are just adding it in. So because there's these two different ways of looking at getting the same exact answer, the, the unfortunate thing is that students will often then subtract and change the sign. They're like, it's cathode minus anode, Chad. So since it's the anode, it's oxidation, so I reversed the sign, and then I subtracted it too. Again, if you're gonna use this one right here, then you have to recall that both of these are using the reduction potential. So whether it be cathode or anode, you're using the exact reduction potential as it appears in the table. All right, so let's see how this works here real quick. So first reaction we're gonna take a look at here is zinc two plus go into cobalt. So I'm sorry, zinc two plus plus cobalt go into zinc plus cobalt two plus. So now if you use this way, you know, it kind of seems like you need to, you know, identify who's the cathode and who's the anode. Well, sort of, but not really. Uh, what you can look at here is we'll kind of look at this in two steps here. And so we're gonna take a look at zinc two plus going to zinc. So zinc two plus is the reactant, zinc's the product. And if we go look over the half reaction that has it, zinc two plus is the reactant, zinc's the product. It's in exactly the same way as in this reaction. And so that is the cathode, it turns out. It's written as a reduction in the forward direction. And that's negative 0.76 volts. All right, so then we're also gonna take a look at cobalt going to cobalt two plus. So, and find the half reaction involving cobalt and cobalt 2 plus. And again, it's uh, convenient to recognize that cobalt is the reactant, cobalt 2 plus is the product. And if you find this half reaction here, notice cobalt 2 plus is the reactant, cobalt is the product. This one is backwards. And so there's a couple different ways to handle this. Either you can change the sign yourself and make it positive, or you can just subtract it as a negative. It is your choice. Personally, I just like to look at it, well, we're doing this reaction going the other way, and so it's positive 0.28 volts. And because I changed the sign myself and made it an oxidation potential, I can just add them together. And so in this case, negative 0.76 volts plus 0.28 volts is gonna get us negative 0.48 volts. Notice, had you just done cathode minus anode and not changed the signs yourself, notice then you would have had negative 0.76 volts, and you would have minus, and then you would have just straight up used it right out of the table, negative 0.28 volts. So minus a negative 0.28 volts, and you still would have arrived at negative 0.48 volts. So if you change the sign yourself, add it in. If you don't change the sign yourself, then subtract, but don't change the sign and subtract by all means. All right, so that's our standard cell potential here. For the given reaction, it is a negative number. And what this means is that this reaction is not spontaneous under standard conditions. And just as a reminder, standard conditions means that all aqueous species have a one molar concentration, all gaseous species have a one atmosphere partial pressure. And so in this case, your two metals in their elemental forms are just solids. So, and then the ions, we expect you to know that aqueous metal ion, I'm sorry, metal ions in these uh, redox reactions are gonna be aqueous. And so in this case, it'd be your zinc two plus and your cobalt two plus that would be present at a one molar concentration for this E cell to be negative 0.48 volts. It also implies that the reverse reactions E cell would be positive 0.48 volts. Just like with delta G, if it's you know negative in one direction, it's positive in the other direction. Same thing here, if, it's, if E cell is negative in one direction, it will be positive in the other direction. So in one thing to note too, if E cell, e cell standard here is a negative number and it's non-spontaneous under standard conditions, well that means 
means that delta G standard would end up being a positive number for this reaction as well, again indicating that it is non-spontaneous in the forward direction under standard conditions. We'll see a little bit later on, uh, in fact a couple lessons down uh, the road in this chapter, that there is a mathematical relationship between delta G standard and E standard, and if E standard is negative, delta G standard has to be positive. They're mathematically related in such fashion. All right, let's do a second example here. All right, the next example we're gonna look at here, so 2Cr3 plus plus 3Cu go into 2Cr plus 3Cu2 plus. So, and I chose this specific example because it's really all about the coefficients. Now, uh, if you compare like what we got going here, Cr3 plus go into Cr, and we compare that to what's on the table here, well, Cr3 plus is reactant, Cr is a product. That matches up with what we're doing here, so that must be a reduction. However, we're doing two Cr3 pluses to two Cr's, and that's gonna be a little bit problematic here. So the question is, do we have to double the value? And this is the one students always struggle with, and the, and the key is we don't. So it turns out we're just gonna use the value right in the table as it is, negative 0.74 volts. So and this is gonna be seem a little bit confusing, because the truth is if you double a reaction, well that doubles delta G, delta H, and delta S we learned back in the thermodynamics chapter. So, but the key is, is it does double delta G. So you notice with CR3 plus going to CR, CR3 plus going to CR, that's a three electron process. So three electrons being gained. Well, if two chromium three pluses are going to two chromiums, that's now going to be a six electron process. And that's the key. Not only does it double delta G, it doubles the joules or kilojoules, but it also doubles the number of electrons involved in the transfer here. And that's the key. So if you take a look at what a volt is, one volt, it turns out equals one joule per coulomb joule per coulomb. And so by again doubling the half reaction here, it doubles the delta G, it doubles the joules. But it also doubles the number of electrons from three to six. And electrons, the charge is measured in coulombs. And so it also doubles the coulombs. And so because you're doubling the joules and the coulombs, the overall ratio stays exactly the same and it's exactly the same number of volts. And so coefficients, you know, if you're you know, multiplying any of these reactions by multiples in any way, shape, or form, it does not change the voltage in any way, shape, or form. Again, back in thermodynamics, you would totally have applied that to delta G, delta H, and delta S calculations, but definitely not for voltage. All right, so still using that negative 0.74 volts, and then we'll take a look at the copper half reaction. And in this case, we're going from copper to copper two plus, so, and notice copper two plus to copper is positive 0.34 volts. So then copper to copper two plus would have an oxidation potential of negative 0.34 volts. And so again, I like personally changing the sign and some of your instructors are not gonna like that I'm doing it this way. So, but whether you wanna take, you know, negative 0.74 and subtract a positive 0.34, so, and subtracting would change the sign for you, or you just want to change the sign yourself and make it negative and then add it, same diff, same diff. And if we add these together, we're going to get negative 1.08 volts for our E cell. And again, because it's a negative number, it implies that the reaction as written in the forward direction would not be spontaneous under standard conditions, but the reverse reaction would. So that's kind of the deal. Cool, so big take home again is with coefficients. Coefficients are not gonna get factored into your calculation of E cells, super important to know. Let's look at one last example. All right, so the last one we're gonna take a look at calculating standard cell potential for is fundamentally different than the first two examples. In the first two examples, I gave you a reaction and you were just supposed to calculate E cell. The reaction was totally provided for you and you know whether it came out positive or negative was just totally based on the reaction. But this one is fundamentally different. So the, the question says, what is the balanced reaction for the galvanic cell composed of MN2 plus MN and Fe2 plus Fe half cells? So what's the balanced reaction? of the galvanic cell, and then we're also gonna calculate E cell, it turns out, as well. So this is different. I haven't given you a reaction. I've told you what are the two half cell are, you know, what two half cells are involved, but I've also given you one other big key piece of information, and that is I've told you it is a galvanic cell. And if it's a galvanic cell, well then that's gonna mean that E cell has to be a positive number. It has to be spontaneous. And what we're gonna extrapolate here is that it's gonna be spontaneous under standard conditions. It's technically not a part of the question, but it's almost always how this question's asked. All right, so 
in this question, we know E cell has to come out positive. In the last ones, we didn't know that at all. The last two questions never said anything about it being a galvanic cell. The entire reaction was provided for you, and it was either going to come out positive or negative, and it wasn't up to you to figure, you know, choose which one it was going to be. It just was what it was based on who was getting oxidized, who was getting reduced. But this one, we get to choose who's being oxidized. We get to choose who's being reduced. It has not been defined for us. There's no provided reaction. But our goal is to make sure that E cell comes out positive. And this is really important because a lot of students have done a problem like this, and then they start to try to apply it to other problems as well and just think like the last ones, well, I have to make sure E cell comes out positive. Well, only if they told you it's a galvanic cell. The last two, I never said it was a galvanic cell. E cell doesn't have to be positive. But this one, it is totally told that you're given a galvanic cell, you know, make it work out. And so E cell has to come out positive in this example since we know it's galvanic. And so the question is which one of these is going to get flipped around backwards? So if we take a look at these, we've got the manganese half reaction right here at negative 1.18 volts, and we've got the iron half reaction at negative 0.44 volts. And so in this case, the question is which one of those, if I change the sign and then add them together, would E cell come out positive? Well, if I change the sign here for iron and make it positive 0.44 volts, well, it's still going to come out to an overall negative E cell by the time I add that to negative 1.18. So negative 1.18 plus 0.44, not a positive number. So that would be the wrong one. And so it actually turns out that therefore it must be the more negative one or less positive one, if you will, that needs to get flipped. And so it's actually going to be the manganese reaction that we do backwards. Let's write this out. So we're going to actually have manganese going to manganese 2 plus, plus 2 electrons. And since this is oxidation, that's going to be positive 1.18 volts. And then the iron 2 plus we're going to leave as reduction. So we still have to have one oxidation and one reduction. You can't, you know, have somebody, you can't have like a reduction, reduction, or an oxidation, oxidation. Somebody has to get oxidized, somebody has to get reduced. So Fe2 plus plus 2 electrons goes to Fe. And that's still negative 0.44 volts. And so now we can add these together. And I'm going to use my calculator. Well, I don't have my calculator handy. So let's see. If we subtract it off 0.4, we get like 1.78, uh, actually 0.78, and another 4, so 0 0.74. And that indeed does come out positive. And so now let's write the balanced reaction. We need to combine these two half reactions. And fortunately, they're both two electron half reactions. This is two electron oxidation, a two electron reduction. So Adding them together is going to be fairly straightforward. And so we're just going to have manganese plus Fe2 plus, there's your reactants, the electrons will cancel, going to manganese 2 plus plus Fe. If these electrons weren't the same number, then you'd have to multiply by, you know, to get the least common multiple, just like we did with balancing redox reactions to make it work. But wasn't our problem in this case, there's your balanced reaction, and the E cell is positive 0.74 volts as a galvanic cell. Had you written this exactly backwards, well, then the E cell would have been negative 0.74 volts. That would not have been spontaneous, and it would not have corresponded to a galvanic cell. All right, so before we finish off this lesson, there's one last bit of, bit of utility uh, for a table of standard reduction potentials that we're going to address. So, and that is identifying who's the strongest oxidizing agent, and who's the strongest reducing agent, those sorts of questions. And, uh, and we can totally get that right off a table of reduction potentials. And so one of them is definitely easier than the other and easier to explain as well. So, but uh, hopefully you can kind of get the idea here. We'll start with the easier one. So what is the strongest oxidizing agent or strongest oxidant? And as you might recall, the oxidizing agent gets reduced. And so if I want the strongest oxidizing agent, well, then I want the species that is most spontaneously reduced. Well, because this is a table of reduction potentials, these are the reactants that are getting reduced. And so any one of these could be your possible answers. These are all your possible oxidizing agents because they're the species getting reduced. Now, in this case, you wouldn't want to pick any of the products. Those are what are you know, resulting from the reduction, but they're not the reactant that's getting reduced. And so if you want to choose an oxidizing agent, you have to choose something that's getting reduced. And if I want the most spontaneous reduction, well, then I want the most positive reduction potential. And in this case, that's way down here at the bottom, and that's going to be Br2. And so Br2, having the most positive value for its reduction potential, is going to be the most spontaneously reduced and therefore the strongest oxidizing agent. 
Now, if we look for the strongest reducing agent, here's where things are going to get a little bit tricky. So before I explain it, so a lot of, a lot of times students memorize this. Well, uh, to get the strongest oxidizing agent, I look for the most positive reduction potential. And to get the strongest reducing agent, I look for the most negative one. Sorta. So, and you still might get the wrong answer. So, so I'm gonna explain it the right way and then explain kind of how you might better look at that than, than just saying the most positive is gonna get you the strongest oxidizing agent, the most negative is gonna get you the strongest reducing agent. It will help you indicate the correct reaction, but you also gotta indicate which is the proper species that's actually gonna be acting as the reducing agent. That's where things get a little bit tricky. So the reducing agent, first off, you gotta realize the reducing agent gets oxidized. So there's our first problem. These are reduction potentials. These are all written as reductions in the forward direction. Well, I don't need to talk about reductions right now for the reducing agent. I need to talk about oxidations, which means I don't need to look at these reactions in the forward direction. I need to look at them all in the reverse direction. And in the reverse direction, these aren't the reactants. In the reverse direction, these are the reactants. And so as a result, these would be the species, Al, not Al3+, Mn, not Mn2+. These would be the reactants getting oxidized, therefore, therefore would be the possible reducing agents. And now again, if I want the strongest reducing agent, then I want the most positive, most spontaneous oxidation potential. And so keep in mind, these are all reduction potentials. The oxidation potential has the opposite sign. And so the question is, which one of these, when you change the sign now, would be most positive? Well, it's gonna be this guy here, and it would be positive 1.66 volts. And the aluminum, again, would be the reactant in that reverse oxidation half reaction. And so here, the strongest reducing agent is aluminum. It's not aluminum three plus. And so here's the deal. A lot of students, again, memorize this, and they say, if you're taking a look at a table of reduction potentials, then the most positive value you see is gonna help you identify the strongest oxidizing agent, and the most negative value in the table you see is gonna help you identify the strongest oxidizing agent. So, except you have to remember which species it is as well, not just identify the reaction. Now again, if you're finding the strongest oxidizing agent, then you want the reactant. So as it's written, with the most positive reduction potential. So, but if you want the strongest reducing agent, if you've memorized it that you get the most negative value on the table, well, that's the most negative reduction potential, which means it actually would have the most positive oxidation potential in reverse. But you also have to remember that it's the aluminum, which is the reactant in the reverse reaction that you're choosing, not the aluminum three plus. So be a little careful. Don't just identify which reaction, you gotta identify which species. And again, all your oxidizing agents are over here as reactants and reduction half reactions. All your uh, reducing agents are the reactants in the reverse oxidation half reactions. Really super important. So the last question is which pairs are going to react spontaneously? And so oftentimes they'll give you a question, you know, and it's A, B, C, D, E, right? And they're going to give you two species and ask you which ones are going to react spontaneously. And in this chapter, they're meaning react in a redox reaction spontaneously. And keep in mind, so we're reacting redox, so that's oxidation reduction, which means you have to pick somebody who can get oxidized and mix them with somebody who can get reduced. There's no such thing as an oxidation-oxidation reaction. There's no such thing as a reduction-reduction reaction. So keep that in mind. So for example, if I gave you Al3 plus and Mn2 plus as a, as a possible pair, So you don't have to do any math here. You don't have to look at anything. You have to look at this and say, okay, Al3 plus can get reduced. Mn2 plus can get reduced. And neither of them are showing up here. And neither of them can therefore do a reverse oxidation or anything like that. So I notice Mn can, but Mn2 plus cannot, according to what we've been provided with here. So uh, as a result, then there's no such thing as reduction reduction. And both of these, according to the data that we have, can only get reduced. Now, if you've got a more complete table of redox potentials, you might find that there are reactions where Mn2 plus actually shows up as the result of reduction. Those totally exist, but it's not provided here. And so if I don't have it in front of me, then I guess I don't know it exists. So based on the data we have, the only thing that can happen to both Al3 plus and Mn2 plus is reduction. And there's no such thing as reduction reduction. And we can just get rid of this as an answer choice. Now, if we do the exact opposite and put aluminum with manganese, well, if you put aluminum with manganese, now we have the exact opposite problem. Aluminum can get oxidized in the reverse reaction. Manganese can also get oxidized in the reverse reaction, but neither of them can get reduced. In fact, metals in general don't get reduced. And so in this case, there's no such thing as an oxidation-oxidation reaction. And again, there's no math here. We're just gonna say this is never gonna happen. All right, so where you've gotta do some math is if you actually are provided with species that can get oxidized and reduced. And 
So I'm going to give you the other two possible combinations here in dealing with just aluminum and manganese. And so now you look at this and you say Al3+. Plus. Well, Al3 plus can get reduced, and then you've got manganese. And you say, oh, manganese could get oxidized in the reverse reaction. Now redox is at least possible. But we're not done yet. Now we've got to do some math. The question is, would it be spontaneous? Well, with Al3 plus getting reduced, that's in the direction that it's written. That would be negative 1.66 volts. So, but then with the manganese, manganese would have to do the reverse reaction. And so instead of being negative 1.18 volts, it would be positive 1.18 volts. And as a result, the negative number is bigger. So as a result, E cell here is not going to be positive. This reaction would not be spontaneous under standard conditions. And so we can rule it out. So the big mistake students make is they'll start trying to do math over here. And one of these is going to come out working if you do the math. But again, there's no such thing as reduction, reduction, or oxidation, oxidation. So you have to know when you don't even need to do any math. And then finally, aluminum and Mn2+. And if we look at this, aluminum can get oxidized in the reverse reaction. Mn2 plus can get reduced in the forward direction. So redux is at least possible. And when aluminum does the reverse reaction, it's going to be positive 1.66 volts. And when manganese 2 plus gets reduced, just as it shows on the table, it's negative 1.18 volts. And now it's the positive number that's bigger. And these will indeed react together spontaneously, giving a positive E cell. So that's kind of how that works. So one thing to note, sometimes this will be taught. If you kind of look at the ones we chose, aluminum and Mn2 plus. So we chose... these two right here. And so sometimes professors will give you a way to kind of identify this without having to do the math. And they'll say, well, you know, if you connect them in an uphill fashion, so as long as you've organized your chart properly here in, in order, so then if you get a, an uphill relationship, it works. Well, in the way I've organized my chart from most negative to most positive, that's true. So, but oftentimes they give you actually the chart in exactly the reverse order where they put the most positive ones at the top and the most negative ones at the bottom. And then it would be downhill <laughs> where the reaction would be spontaneous. And so uh, it also means that, you know, what if you've invited these values, but not in any kind of organized chart? Well, then you'd have to write them out and organize them in the proper order. And you'd have to remember, well, do I put the most positive ones at the top and the most negative ones at the top? And so I just never do that. I always just work out the math. I work out and say, okay, aluminum had to get oxidized. That's opposite of what's on the chart. So it's positive 1.66 volts. Manganese C plus gets reduced just as it shows on the chart, negative 1.18 volts. And when you add these together, E cell will be positive, And these will indeed react spontaneously. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, a like and a comment let me know are pretty much the best things you can do to support the channel. And if you're looking for general chemistry help or anything involving standard cell potentials or electrochemistry, take a look at my general chemistry master course. It includes over 1,200 practice questions, study guides, final exam, rapid reviews, practice final exams. Uh, I'll leave a link in the description. Free trial is available. Happy studying.